Hello again, and welcome to the latest installment of Ipswich, What's the Plan? I'm Rich Kalman, and on this program, I sit with Glenn Gibbs, the Director of Planning and Development for Ipswich, and we discuss uh, planning issues that are facing the town of Ipswich. In our first two episodes, we discussed uh, public art and um, the lo some long-term economic goals for the town of Ipswich. Um, today's program is going to focus on housing and what Ipswich is doing to meet the housing needs of its members. Um, I asked Glenn to bring along Charlie Allen, who is the chair of the Ipswich Housing Partnership. Um, and together we're all going to discuss the steps that Ipswich is taking to uh, keep housing affordable for its residents. Glenn, welcome. Charlie, thanks for coming along. Thank you. Um, so Glenn, let me just start off by saying, you know, how and when and why did the town feel that it should be involved in meeting the housing needs of the community? Sure. The, well, as anyone who I think lives here knows that the cost of housing in Ipswich is, is quite high and uh, most of us either know a number of people or have family members or maybe even uh, in, in ourselves in some instances have been uh, unable to afford to, uh, to buy a home here and, uh, and, uh, and rentals can be, uh, can be very expensive too. And uh, so that's been a, 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 an acknowledged need for the community for, for a number of years. Uh, when uh, the town was going through planning processes in the late 90s and in the early 2000s, uh, one of the things that came out of those conversations was the, the, the fact that what was very important about Ipswich was its diversity uh, of its population, both economically and socially, and it's what distinguished it from a number of the other communities on the North Shore and what, what attracted a lot of people, including myself, uh, to live in this community. And, uh, and it, it's also obvious that that kind of diversity can't ma be maintained if we don't provide mm -hmm. a range of housing opportunities. If the only thing that uh, we're building in this town are single family homes that are, that are starting at 750,000, uh, we'll get nice people moving into those, uh, those houses. But if that's all we're developing over time, that, uh, that diversity is, is lost. And so uh, when the community development plan was uh, adopted in 2003, there was a very clear uh, set of goals and policies uh, around the, the notion of having, uh, trying to do whatever the town can do to maintain this diversity. And so uh, having, uh, making efforts to provide housing for all types, all types of housing for all uh, residents, regardless of income, uh, has been uh, a, a, a large part of the town's goals for many years now. So, so what? Once the town, you know, decided yes, they were going to make a pro, take a proactive approach. You know, what initiatives has the town started over the last few years? There, were, there are a couple different categories. One was we tried to do whatever we could with town-owned property. If we had control over land, then that means we could could do what we wanted with that land, and we could. Uh, use that to provide uh, and meet affordable housing needs. And then the other uh, part of the approach that we've been taking as a town is through zoning measures, uh, through uh, uh, providing funding assistance, and, uh, and, and then and the zoning measures have encouraged or even required uh, the private sector to provide opportunities for uh, housing for folks of lower income in their developments. Okay. Well, you know, the term affordable housing is thrown around, but, but Charlie, what exactly is, you know, the definition of affordable housing? Yeah. Uh, and it varies a little bit, um, kind of by, by program type. Generally speaking, um, in the zoning bylaw, there's a definition of 80% uh, of median is the ceiling um, for, for who we're trying to, to facilitate housing opportunities for. And the, the, there's figures that are published for that, um, and they vary by household size, but 80% of median um, currently for a single person is around $35,000. For a family of four is almost $70,000. So re relatively high. Um, now some of the, the specific projects that the town has played a role in, um, either through the partnership providing funding for um, or or kind of housing produced um, as a consequence of zoning um, restrictions uh, is scaled to, 
to help people at lower income levels. Um, on the other hand, Glenn, it occurs to me the, the infill provision is one where there's not a specific uh, income level for the ultimate homeowner. Rather, there's restrictions on the size of the home, and these are homes built on very small lots by definition uh, anyway. But so the effort there is just create modest scale housing, which otherwise doesn't get built in Ipswich much. Um, so it offers an opportunity that just, um, again, is for a slightly higher income person, but somebody who might otherwise really have trouble finding a place to live in town. You know, and I think later on, let's, we can talk about some of those actual right. projects right. that right. have and produced And that, that last point that what he was just talking about, that moderate housing, there has been interest expressed by the, uh, the Board of Selectmen and by the town manager for uh, the partnership and, and the planning office to get involved more to try to provide some more of those opportunities for housing that, that doesn't strictly meet the affordable requirement, but would meet a need in the community. And, uh, and the, the infill housing mechanism that, that Charlie mentioned that we've done, uh, we've had four of those. Uh, uh, we believe uh, that that would be an excellent mechanism to expand to meet some of that moderate income need that's been talked about. So that's, uh, th that's something that could very well be coming out uh, on the table sometime later this year as a, as a possible approach to provide more housing for that, for that group of folks. Okay. Well, and I'd like to talk a little bit about that, yep. but Charlie, let me just tell me some more about the housing partnership. I mean, what, when was it established and, you know, what has sure. it been engaged in? What benefits has the housing partnership brought to the community? Mm -hmm. I, uh, I think it was created in about 1990. Um, and I think early on there were some folks doing real hard work and, and uh, kind of uh, taking on some specific projects that turned into, to, you know, to good results in town that are still affordable housing. Um, uh, I've been involved for probably five or six years uh, is all. Um, and I think there was a period of time when the partnership was, uh, was not as active as it was in the early years and it has been lately. Um, but over the past few years, um, we, we've had some funding that we've been able to put to use in, in a variety of ways. Um, we're, uh, we don't have any authority as a board. We do have some money to, to deploy. Um, but we also are kind of a, a, a body that um, advocates for affordable housing, and so we'll, we will weigh in on policy issues um, and on uh, interpretations of some zoning issues that the planning board um, is working through. Um, so we're, uh, y you know, we are a, uh, a board that um, kind of, uh, make sure that we're uh, bringing what resources we can to bear on affordable housing. We're trying to communicate with folks so that residents know what resources are out there. Um, and we're also just trying to advocate on a policy level for, for good results. So, so Glenn, working with the housing partnership, you know, what initiatives has the town taken through zoning and, and other means to, to create uh, a, 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 a number of things, and uh, but I also want to Note that in addition to, some, to these things uh, we made allusion to or reference to earlier, there were several town properties that the town yep. uh, went, went forward with and through uh, a lot of effort and, and a fair amount of money expended, much of it that we were able to gather from outside sources, uh, we're, we were able to develop uh, 25 or so units on those, uh, those town owned properties. So that was one way that, that, uh, we, that we've, one way we've been meeting the affordable housing need in the community. But as far as uh, the, the, the other types of initiatives that we've done, there's been a whole range of them. And I'll, I'll just, uh, I'll tick through a bunch of them. Uh, one was back uh, starting in 97 and uh, was the first effort and then we modified it again in, in 2001, a provision that's called inclusionary housing, uh, which uh, requires when multifamily housing is being developed in the town, which is three or more units, uh, that uh, some percentage of those units be provided for persons of uh, low to moderate income. And uh, the, if there are less than 10 units, then the developer can make a payment rather than uh, the actual provision of the unit. But if it's 10 or more units, then, then you need to provide on a percentage basis uh, at least uh, one unit for every 
to yeah. 10 markets that you're and, building. And so what, what are some projects that, have, that you can think of that have actually had some of those units created? Uh, well, there's the mill house, new mill uh, housing on Brownville Avenue. That was our first one uh, that was done around uh, 2000, I think, uh, maybe a little before that. Mm -hmm. And there, there were two units that were created there. Uh, there's a unit at, uh, at we call Southgate, the, the development off of uh, mm -hmm. Essex Road, 6 Essex Road, I think. Um, and uh, let's see what other ones were created from that particular measure. Um, Green Street was there. Oh, yeah. Yep, Green Good, Street. Thank you. Yes, yep. Green Street, uh, 16 Green. There were three units that were provided for, uh, for that project. And... Uh, there are some other projects that haven't been built yet that the units are promised. 15 Market Street, there are two affordable units that will be coming out of that. Right. So if a developer comes to town with a proposal, <coughs> it's, if it's of a certain size, <coughs> it has to be affordable units Correct. with it. Correct. Okay. So other than that, you know. So, yeah, so moving talking? on, uh, okay. yep. one of the things that we did, uh, and these are, this is an instance where these units are not restricted. Uh, they, anyone could live in, in these units and there's no income qualification whatsoever. But it's still been helpful for the, the Ipswich for, for uh, regulating costs in Ipswich. Uh, and these are accessory apartments. Now, when we uh, first started doing this in, I think, 97, we, were, we called them in-law apartments and they could only be for uh, family members. And then a few years later, we modified that to say, well, we'll let it, you can do it for anybody, uh, and, but, it's still, but it has to be inside the envelope of the building. And, and f since then, we've actually allowed for a certain percentage of the unit to be created outside of the building, like the, uh, through an addition. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, but uh, it still has a number of limits on it. The uh, property owner has to live there, uh, and it, there's only, a, I think, eight or 900 square feet is the maximum. There has to be a separate entrance, all kinds of uh, limitations on it. But having that ability has been good first for the property owner because in many cases property owners you know, may have a hard time uh, maintaining as particularly as they get older and they're on fixed income, uh, maintaining, the co maintaining uh, their houses. And this gives them away by being able to rent uh, a unit. And, uh, but also it can be helpful for family members uh, that maybe can't afford to live anywhere else in town. Is this still a special permit at the end of the it's day? A, it's a special yeah. permit from the Zoning Board of Appeals. Mm -hmm. Now there's, so, but, the, but there's, there are other mechanisms as well. So I described that one. Uh, oh, we also passed a, a bylaw in 2001 that allows for a up to 100% increase in density uh, for subdivision development if the developer uh, agrees to uh, develop it in a cluster format, which means concentrate the housing on this portion of the property and provide open space uh, around it, uh, and provide uh, affordable housing or, or, or payment into the affordable housing fund. Yeah. And we have had a couple projects. The project that's now being developed off of Linebrook Road, uh, off of Howard Street, uh, that's an eight unit project, and uh, that uh, is providing the payment, I think that's providing an $80,000 payment. Well, there's a source of funds that, that'll be coming Good. at some point the to, the, to place, our trust fund. <coughs> Partridgeberry <coughs> Place was prior to that, was it? Um, okay. so it didn't provide any, uh, uh, but, and, and what didn't need to, it didn't, it didn't require the density bonus anyway, so. Um, anyway, so that's its second one, uh, third one. Um, oh, and then another, uh, another mechanism that's been around since 2001 is if you have an accessory building on your lot, and it could be have been a, a carriage house, it could have been a barn, could have been a large garage, uh, they that potentially can be converted into a residential dwelling unit uh, by special permit from the planning board. But it does require that a number of things. There there are limitations and requirements that are attached to it, such as the planning board needs to determine that there's a community benefit that's being provided by the establishment of that unit. And one way to get a community benefit is to make that unit uh, permanently affordable by putting a restriction on it. But, but if they don't want to make it affordable, there are other things that, other methods to contribute to affordable housing. They can make a payment. They can make a payment. Or they could meet another community benefit if they're having it uh, made available for a family member 
Uh, often that might be a, an aging parent or a young child, uh, well, not too young, but a child. Mm -hmm. And uh, in, in those instances, that can be considered a benefit too. Or if the if the if the uh, building is historically or architecturally significant, that could be another reason. So, but but so, but but it does provide by having relatively low cost additional housing provided, as Charlie will tell you, as Charlie's a housing in the housing business, that uh, it's by by providing more housing availability, uh, even if it's not affordable, it can help to. Uh, you know, it's it's the it's the well, demand it's, when the demand it's also exceeds a, a, the supply, a, a supply right. and demand right. problem. Right. And if right. there's more supply, especially right. of modestly scaled stuff, yep. that's places for people to live that right. otherwise would have a hard time finding right. a place I mean, to live. You, on switch. How right. many units would you think have been created through either in-law apartment, excuse me, accessory apartments, right. um, conversions? I, I was jotting some yeah. of those down, Rich. Um, okay. And it yep. uh, on the inclusionary. Um, about 20 units on the uh, on the accessory apartment. About 40 um, on the accessory building. Um, 15, and then the in-law provision, which you haven't gotten to again, but we mentioned in earlier. Infill. Excuse me, the infill um, is is for new homes built. Right, four single-family homes, right? So it gets uh, to yeah. some material numbers. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it's safe to say that I mean, it's what you could say has been proactive. More, more progressive plan than, than some other communities? Very, very much so. I yeah. think, I mean, I'm not saying we're the be all and end all of affordable housing. It's easier for me to say than uh, Glenn the planner. Okay. Um, but, you know, a lot of this stuff came together in the early 2000s. Um, and, and for a period of that time, I was on the planning board too, so I, I, I knew about it. Um, and I, you know, I think we got a lot of feedback from the people around the state that we were progressive doing stuff. Uh, earlier than a lot of communities and, and of, of, on a bigger scale, um, given especially what a, you know, a relatively small town with relatively small amount of buildable land uh, mm -hmm. w we are. So, so I'm gonna, so Charlie, when, what do you think of the accomplishments of the partnership then that you're proudest of then, um, you know, through, you know, first you saw it as a planning board member and then yeah. Continuing through. Well, and you know, and I think as we talk about this stuff, uh, I tend to lump together the the partnership specific work with kind of the other counts of affordable homes that you know are a function of um, you know town initiatives on town owned land that Glenn has mentioned, or just uh, policy you know zoning policy. Um, so if we talk about the partnership specifically for a minute. Um, the partnership, uh, and, and I'll mention the, um, the Ipswich Affordable Housing Trust, the partnership and the trust really kind of function as one body, but are technically two bodies, and the trust is the, the repository for the funds yeah. that come into you know, the system, if you will, um, either th through payments in lieu, um, sometimes accessing home funds for specific programs and initiatives, um, but there's been about a million and a half dollars that have gone through the trust uh, since it yeah. was created. And that um, was created, just to, to jump in, that was created yeah. in the early 2000s after we adopted the inclusionary bylaw and we started getting money coming into the town uh, from developers and uh, there have been some, a couple other sources where the yeah. funds have come from. Yeah. So we needed a place to put it, as Charlie said. Yeah. And, uh, and so we have that, that mechanism and so it's the, the, the members of the trust fund board are the ones that have the authority to determine how to spend it. Right. Yep. Um, but uh, the, it's the partnership, it's more the policy making board and the way the, the trust fund board is set up, it requires that three, is it two or three, two or three of the uh, partnership members have to be on the, the trust fund board. And so that there's a very close connection and they meet uh, they meet jointly. They really. They, yeah. they, 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 they and as really a practical matter, you know, we're very much a, a you know a cohesive group. Um, and generally speaking, uh, you, you know, anything the partnership uh, thinks is a good idea, the, the trust fund has been in the, the dialogue and, and right. agrees is a good idea. Right. right. Yep. So Glenn, l let me just bring up one. So point. Well, yeah, so you asked me a question. Let me go back and finish. Oh, okay. So just <laughs> to some specific examples. Okay. Um, uh, First-time homebuyer programs, where okay. the the partnership and the trust 
are basically providing down payment money for income qualified first time home buyers. Uh, there's been 43 of those. Um, so helping people buy their first home uh, over the last couple and of years. And those are also not restricted. You, you don't have to, uh, well, you have to be income eligible to get the assistance. But there's no requirement that the that the housing unit itself be put under kind of restriction. Oh, so yeah. the idea is that you're getting somebody into the market, but you know as they progress on with their lives, they may be making you know uh, more money than that. In that, but doesn't matter. Uh, it's it's they were helped to come into the system, and that's what's what's uh, what's important. Yeah. Um, one other program that that has been very active for the last year or two, uh, the housing rehab program, um, and that's simply where. Uh, people living in the community qualifying below that 80% of, of median income standard can come into us and say, I've got problems with my heating system, I've got problems with my roof, I don't have the resources to fix them, um, and we will uh, loan them the money uh, really at, at, you know, at no cost. Ultimately, if they sold the home, they'd have to repay it, but the idea is um, help people stay in their homes. Um, and the majority of the people who have come in and received these loans from us are elderly folks. Um, so that's, uh, and we've gotten some grant funds and some home funds available through kind of a county consortium to, to help us augment our dollars. Um, and so we've, you know, leveraged our resources to, to help a bunch of people there. So now you said a million and a half has been spent over the years. What's the balance in the fund now? Uh, it's low, uh, you know, and that's a, a, a challenge. We, we've been so yeah. good at, uh, at getting it out the door uh, lately that, um, that the balance is down under $100,000 um, and starts to compromise, um, you know, what we can kind of have in the works uh, for the next year or two, although um, we're hopeful that there's some other sources of funds that, that are going to come in and replenish that. Okay. Um, well, and, and, you know, it sure. just occurred to me, one of the things that we maybe didn't mention that um, is be, has been funded, or maybe we did, but I missed it, uh, the Affordable Housing Trust Fund is a, is a home rehab program that we've been running uh, of late that's, that's been using probably the, the largest chunk of our money uh, to help uh, owner, homeowners, often older uh, residents who don't have the ability to fix their homes up and they get money from us to do that. Uh, they have to be income eligible, but again, we don't put a limitation on the house, and and that's been a very beneficial program. I think we've helped nine, uh, we've helped rehab nine houses already. Did we mention that already? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Did. Okay. yeah. I thought I did, but you maybe did, I didn't. How did I didn't explain that? it very well? Okay. <laughs> All right. So well, just in case you uh, yeah. somebody was dozing out there. It's good to get it twice. It's good yeah. twice. Yeah. So, Glenn, one of the things that I've heard over the years representing folks when they want to do a project yeah. like. Uh, a conversion yeah. um, is, you know, what am I going to have to pay to the board? I assuming that I don't want to go in the route of, of making it affordable, what can I expect to pay? And I'm wondering how the partnership, and what we hear at the board as well, we'll, we'll check with the partnership and see what the ho affordable housing partnership recommends. Um, you know, what, what's the criteria that goes into that decision when a homeowner comes before the board and says, look, I want to do this. Um, you know, the board recognizes, obviously, that there's an economic benefit to the homeowner, but how, how do you strike the number that should be fair, not for a developer who's making real profit, but for, say, a homeowner who wants to take advantage of it? All right. Well, uh, first off, I think it's important to, to sort of put in context uh, this question uh, because the, the majority of instances where there are payments that are required to be paid they are they are they are uh, specified the exact amount in the bylaw. Uh, there's only two instances, and one of which you pointed out, uh, where there's some discretion on the part of the board on what that payment well, is. Th those are the ones we should talk about. Right. Where, I, where there's discretion. Right. But I want but okay. I want to point that out that it's not uh, uh, every single instance where there's a payment. And it's you know someone sticking their finger up in the air and saying, oh, well, "What's the wind blowing today? This is how much you have to pay." Um, the, the vast, not the vast, but the majority of them are, are already established in the bylaw. The two instances where they're not, one is through the exercise of a density bonus that's provided uh, by our bylaw uh, if you uh, are willing 
uh, to provide some additional community benefit to the town. And the community benefit is defined as further affordable housing, uh, or affordable housing of any kind, I guess, yes, uh, or uh, a public uh, recreational facility. Uh, those are the two things that, that are considered to be a public benefit. So let me, let me give you an example. You have a, a proposed multifamily project, and the, the zoning bylaw in, in, in its uh, schedule of uh, dimensional schedule, density schedule, says that for this property, the maximum density that you can get is 10 units. Right? But uh, you would like to build more than that. And if you look to this density bonus, you can, you, you, and you, you realize that if you apply that bonus, you can build 14 units. And uh, so if that's the case, then the by, the, what the bylaw says is that you may be able to go up to the 14, but you're gonna to have to meet some additional community benefit. And the planning board has to determine what that community benefit is. So in that instance, it's difficult uh, to state up front specifically what that's going mm -hmm. to be because it really determined, is based on the circumstances of what's happening. Now, that said, uh, I think that there is certainly an ability, and the, and the, and the uh, partnership has talked about this, uh, and, I, and I've talked about it with, uh, uh, with them as well, and we are looking to uh, establish some, some guidelines for how we might, some, some parameters or some guidelines for making those decisions about what you might need to do uh, to satisfy community mm -hmm. benefit uh, under footnote 11. Right, because that what you're talking about is really right. a developer situation again, because if you're looking for a density bonus, it's for a right. project that hasn't been built. Okay, so right. now we're going to so, shift to the other situation. Uh, but you, that, but when you, that's important, because yeah. I mean, developers coming into town, right. read the bylaw, would like right. to have some sense okay. what's it going to cost us, but, but for the average homeowner. Right. So we're going to yep. switch to the other uh, situation, which is the conversion of accessory buildings into dwellings. And as we said earlier, I think there have been about 15, 16 of those uh, since the bylaw was adopted. That provision was established by town meeting in 90, I mean, sorry, 2001, I think it was. Um, so the vast majority of those units that have been created have been created under the provision that they were being made available to family members. Uh, Again, a ch child or or, an, or a parent. So there's no there's no money issue there. There have been a couple of them that were were done and were set up uh, as affordable units with a permanent restriction. There are a couple that were done because uh, they got approval because it was an historically significant building. There have only been three, I believe, out of that those 15 or 16, where the the owner. Uh, requested that they meet the community benefit mm -hmm. uh, by making a payment. And, uh, and so the, the number of instances where this has happened has been pretty limited, but there has been discussion and people have said, well, how come uh, this person paid this and this person paid that and um, this person paid that? So like I, well, I just said for the other situation, we are uh, going to be working on some regulations to provide some parameters or some guidelines for uh, how the dollar amount ultimately will to be assessed. Now, I'll, I'll say that the planning board's position, as well as the partnerships, is that to avoid those kind of payments as much as possible, they'd much rather have uh, a, an affordable unit or a family member being benefited uh, than, than a payment into the fund, although now that, now that we're yeah, drawing down, I guess we could have Yeah, but that's interesting if the fund it. is low. Well, I guess, know, what, I guess, I mean, we're not going to walk away from it, but, uh, yeah, yeah. But, we, but we found that yeah. what we prefer above all is to have units created, not to have money put in the fund to create the units. What do you think, Joe? That, that, that yeah. is, historically, certainly, that is true. Um, you know, it's hard to actually create, develop new affordable units. Um, so typically, if there's, um, you know, if there's a private motivation to create a new unit, um, we'd much rather see them create that unit affordably than give us money to then have us try to initiate another development. Okay? Now, lately, 
the rehab program is a good example of how we found, you know, uh, eager reception for that program for people who need it in the community, and we've run through a lot of dollars using that program. Um, so we're a little bit more hungry for dollars than usual, but I don't think that shakes um, really the, 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 you know, the, the position we've held, which is we'd always like to see people create affordable units, and we come off of that not so much because we want those dollars, but because we recognize it's impractical to get those units affordable in some cases and still have something move forward. And, you know, it's more the planning board's job than ours to see, you know, to balance um, kind of people's right to, to, to build things with affordability, but we recognize that. So when we're asked for advice, you know, we try to, to weigh, you know, the, the fairness issue as well. Yeah, and, and just to, to add to, when the, when the partnership is reviewing a project to give advice to the planning board, uh, it's uh, it's not picking numbers out of the sky. Uh, I mean, there are criteria that are used. I mean, one of the things that we can look at is when you say when you're doing an inclusionary housing project and uh, you're doing ten units, uh, you you would have one affordable unit, but for each of those additional units, it's ten thousand. So. You could say, using that basis, it would be, say, $100,000 for an actual creation of a new unit. So you have a basis by which you can compare uh, provision of a unit and a, and a dollar payment. Uh, so I'm not saying that it's a great science to it, uh, but it's, it's not done willy-nilly. That being said, I do think that we could be a little bit more... Um, defined in, in the manner that we... I just mentioned we, we did gather a bunch of information on what other communities have uh, and, and there are communities with you know kind of formulaically specified um, payments um, for different zoning provisions uh, by and large those figures scare us as uh, well I say us uh, uh, the planning board you know from a from a are we going to obstruct development perspective if you look around at other communities, the numbers are really big. Um, so yeah, our, our numbers so, are much, much lower. So you're now. saying, uh, yeah. would, would, are you, is that an argument for saying we shouldn't make it so formulaic because what you see in formulas would scare people? And the, I just, there, well, is, there is that argument. I'm, you know, I'm not yep. sure that that's kind of what I think is the prevalent argument, um, but I, it, there is that argument is why I mentioned it. I can tell you that you know when we've had this discussion in the past and we look at other communities and the numbers are five, six, seven times higher than what, what our requirements are for, from payments, uh, we, I always think about it and I think the conversation often comes back to, well, that, that's well and good, but what's, you know, are we going to uh, price ourselves out? Are we going to put a requirement in there that just can't be met and so we're just going to shut down affordable housing, I mean any kind of multifamily development. And that's, that's the last thing that we want to do. So we've always been very sensitive. Now, I'm sure there would be some who would suggest, well, you did shut us down because we couldn't make that. Mm -hmm. But we're always we're very thoughtful and sensitive about that because we realize that that's not productive. Okay. And so. Okay. Well, let's, let's just wrap up. I think that's been very helpful. Just, you know, going forward, what are the, you know, the challenges that you see facing, you know, the housing partnership and, and affordability just in the you know, immediate future. You know, I, I'll tell you, one of the things that the partnership has um, been thinking about a lot for the last year or so is, um, you know, you asked the question, what do you mean by affordable housing? And we, we tried to answer it. Um, but a lot of people don't know what affordable housing is. Um, and, y you know, and I think as we all know, there's kind of a negative connotation for a lot of folks uh, about what affordable housing is. Um, and that's unfortunate. And it certainly obstructs, uh, we think, our ability to uh, kind of have people respond favorably to what we're trying to do um, and and kind of the other uh, challenge that we face is you know if we've got programs and people can take advantage of them we want them to know that we want them to come in so uh, you picked it up w one of the things the partnership has done is created uh, this flyer to try to explain the different programs and put a little context on uh, what we mean by affordable housing what resources are out there um, these were sent uh, around to, uh, to everyone in Ipswich, um, and, uh, and I hope it's helping, and we'll continue to be making efforts to uh, just wave the flag a little bit and um, explain to people, you know, what, 
what the partnership is and, and what the resources are. Glenn, anything you want to well, say? Well, I, I could say that as someone who's in the office every day, we, yeah. we have had a fair number of people have, have come in specifically because they received the brochure or they made a phone call and arranged to come in. So, so, that's, uh, so that's, a, that's a positive. Well, um, I'd just like to thank you for your time today, and I thank you at home for watching, and, and I hope you'll tune in um, for our next installment of Ipswich, What's the Plan? Thank you.